Uh, thank you for joining. Let's just get started. My name is Abdi. I'm from Monsoon Sim. And here with, here with us is Dr. Christine uh, from Deakin University and also Derek from Melbourne. Okay. Um, so here's the rundown. I will start, right? I'll talk about Monsoon Sim a little bit. Um, I'll go through the concept and then I'll run a game and then I'll show a running game. All right. Then. I will then um, let pass the uh, pass the time to um, Christine. She will talk more about the how Deakin is using it, and also Derek after that the data analytics. Okay. Um, the whole idea about Monsoon Sim is that why teach this way when the learning can be done in another way? All right. And also, um, why study like this if the real world is like that? Right. So that's the basis of our design and our discussion. So the, I think this is the most important picture, right? If you can uh, see this, this is probably the most important, is that Monsoon Sim allows a teacher to configure the system into various scenarios, right, business environment, and let learners learn in a horizontal progressive uh, way from uh, easiest way to more difficult and more difficult uh, scenarios. Okay, it's an evolving concept. I, I think uh, this is the most important picture of, of the described Monsoon Sim, right? So it's in a cloud that you can, you as the certified trainer can configure uh, various uh, business scenarios so that your learners can learn horizontally uh, from left to right, all, you know, learning it not in the silo, but interdepartmental progressive, uh, you know, uh, step by uh, evolving difficulties. Now, let me just go through, I'm going to zoom in this bit, yeah? I'm going to zoom in and explain more about the Monsoon Sim platform. Okay, so here's the Monsoon Sim platform. I'm going to zoom in. Now, we have 13 departments uh, digitized in our platform. Uh, each of these departments consists of many micro concepts. Okay, so from service, procurement, retail, etc. Et uh, let's take a look at them. And these are the micro concept, right? Let's say in finance, we'll talk about cats on hand and so on. And then for procurement, talk about lead time and discount and so on and also etc. Now, with all these micro concept, then we allow the learners to learn in a step-by-step -step horizontal learning, fun, exciting game for all level, right? It could be a game, it could be a simulation. So Monsoon Sim is actually a combination of gamification and simulation, right? So you can teach through simulation or you can teach through gamification, okay? So now uh, we talk about, so this is the beginners and then we talk about uh, for the more advanced uh, students, they can turn on more features and well, then you have intermediate, okay? And then you can have advanced. And then you can also have uniquely configured game here, right? So you can emphasize your scenario based on certain uh, modules that you want to turn on and off, okay? All right, so now let's just pull back a bit. Once again, I'd like to remind everybody that this is what this whole platform is all about, right? Without, look, without missing the big picture. So <coughs> I want to share with you, um, so with this, now I'm going to zoom in one more time. Bear with me. I'm going to zoom in one more time to look at all these three little bubbles here. Yeah. So bear with me. I'm zooming in now. Okay. So what is some, what is, what are the things that you can configure as a teacher? You can configure the timing and the tempo. You can set the teams and the players. You can set the robots. We have a number of robots in the system. The robots can play against a human and also with the human, right? So the robot can be something that uh, someone to, to uh, play along the, the learners uh, and, and do transactions on their behalf. And then we have live chats. This is very good for current pandemic situations. And then we have the configuration sharing. So once you have designed your configuration, let's say you set up a, a lean manufacturing game, you could share the configuration globally to, with other universities so that they can use your configuration or you can use others config, uh, configuration. And we also have micro courses. So for example, if don't, you don't, you, you know, you don't wanna bother with uh, configure your own game, 
you can just use our uh, pre-configured micro courses. It's 14 set of courses that makes up uh, entire semester's coursework. So you can just run them. We'll show you some example later, okay? Micro course. And then we have this virtual teaching assistant. So if you teach, um, it's good that you can guide the student along. However, if you don't have the time or you don't have the uh, access, you can also send in the boss, what we call the virtual teaching assistant. So this, this, uh, this will guide the student along when they play the game, right? So the, the, you don't have to, it take away a lot of the, your, your time, really. It, 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 sorry, it, it, it'll give you a lot of time for other things because the, the, the virtual assistant is, um, it will give timely advice based on your student's current situation. So if, for example, if they're lacking, it, like in, let's say their cash is tight, then the guide would guide them along. All right, now moving on to the next bubble, which is the simulation configuration. Here are the things that you can configure in Monsoon Sim. Customers, suppliers, products, services, warehouse, retail store, location, employees, e-commerce, machines, currency, banks, departments. So these are the things that you're free to configure. However, you can also use the default or you can use the micro course, which already set up for you. Okay, so here's the, here's the, now, what are the outcomes? When you run this game, uh, run the simulations, there'll be a lot of outcome, of course. Uh, let's take a look at some of the outcomes. You can do the KPI monitoring. Okay, you can do a live observation of the, of the, of the real-time uh, KPIs of the learners. Uh, you can also uh, look at their target. You can also set target for them to achieve. You can also, set a, uh, a scoring metric that is based on the relative strength from team to team. So relative strength is called scoring metric. And here we have this data analytics studies, uh, live access. It means that the student, when, when the, once they play the game, the data actually can be tapped into directly from your platform such as R, such as Tableau, such as Power BI, okay, live. So Derek is gonna show you more about this later. And then of course you have a very comprehensive uh, game report that you can uh, print out and also send to the learners. Okay, so just uh, take a peek at the KPI. For example, we have four, five teams here playing and then here the KPI retail sales, net profit, et cetera, et cetera. And then their target is 6 million and they are now currently attending, uh, you know, attaining 8.2, uh, 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 800,000. So their score is 14 points. So this is a total score based on the KPI. Okay, so that is, now this is a, a closer look at the KPI observations, such as the average cost and then the cash on hand and then net profit, etc. Okay, so this is the KPI observation. This is a scoring matrix. And then for example, this, this particular game is being uh, monitored and, and scored based on cash on hand being how many percent, maybe 10%, the net profit, operating expense. This is something that the teacher can configure and the, and the learners have to fight for it, okay? So every game you can configure the whole measurement uh, depending on your, your, your uh, focus of the game. And then this is a live access, which Derek will show a lot more later. So there you have it. Uh, once again, I like to always come back to this big picture because so, you, so that you understand, you, know, you as a teacher, you configure Monsoon Sim and let the learners learn, and then they learn through this uh, uh, experiential learning, okay? So, that is now in case you like to look at how people playing i just want to do like five seconds of this so this is how Okay, so that is how uh, the university, uh, one university in Singapore is using it. Okay, so um, this is the latest testimonial we've got from uh, Severin Grabski uh, from Michigan State University. Uh, it says that, you know, um, I can see that it's using this is for the MBA program, uh, introduce students to have limited background on task integration required in the setting. And then looking at, I'm looking forward to using the same in my ERP class in place of the, this. And also I have been looking at tool that helps demonstrate the integration of ERP uh, system and also um, 
uh, so that's something that uh, uh, you know there's uh, and then this is from San Diego State Universities there's also uh, 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 there's also a publication from uh, University of Malaysia uh, Technology Malaysia and this is from Hong Kong UST uh, testimonial and also we can get from Deakin University this is from Christine uh, Christine is going to show more later. Okay, so that is my presentation. I'd like to jump back to the uh, to the uh, agenda and the agenda uh, calls for a live demonstration. So now I'm going to do a live demonstration. Um, I hope I'm doing well in time. That's good. My time is looking good. So now let me just go back to my uh, I'm going to I'm going to do two things here, right? First, I'm going to create a simple game and run a few days, and then I'm going to pick a, 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 a game that has run a couple of days ago and show you the result of that game, okay? So now I'm going to create a game and run for a few days. Uh, so this is how uh, me as a teacher uh, create a game. All right, so I'm gonna call it a demo. Uh, demo now uh, I'm going to use a server called uh, my Australian server that's where I'm from now I'm going to use uh, the Australian baseline now we have a number of baseline here um, the baseline uh, is set of configuration pre-configured for you all you have to do is you just run it and but there are various there are differences between Australia and Germany and Hong Kong mostly in 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 the in the location of the retail stores right so the location of the business uh, is pre-configured. So for example, in Australia, you see all the whole Australian location and also the Australian measurement, which is in uh, kilometers and so on. But if it's in the US, they use uh, miles and so on. So I'm gonna use the Australian baseline. So that's it. I have created my first game, right? There you go. So that's, so imagine you, you're all uh, the learners, then I've created this game. I'm going to uh, run it in the game demo. And here we go. That's game demo, right? Now, uh, earlier I, I mentioned that I'm using the Australian baseline. That, you know, obviously we are using the Australian cities. Now these cities are configurable. You can change it if you don't like it. In fact, you can pull in some universe, some, some city from Jakarta or from Denpasar that is close enough for them to do business with. Uh, you can change Melbourne to somewhere in Australia if you like. So these are all configurable, but as I said, we have pre-configured for you. So there's learners then when we start the game, the learners will then start making their business in this location, uh, create, uh, sorry, operating their business in these locations. Okay, they can set up shops and they can set up warehouse uh, and so on. So if they shut up retail, they become a green color. If it's, you know, this uh, uh, warehouse, it would be this color. Okay, and then every location has their own attributes, such as the population and so on, which really affects their demand uh, when they play the game. Okay, and because of this population and so on, it also affects their rental value. Okay, so if you set up a retail store, you have to pay this much and this much and so on. Uh, and so this is just a location. Uh, and here, there's, here you can see a lot of parameters you can set. Uh, like for example, you can, click here and then further change the configuration, change it. For example, you like to allow uh, the virtual trainer. Earlier I say there's a virtual trainer, virtual teaching assistant, I'm going to allow that. Okay, so here's the, I turn it on and then I'm going to turn on whatever. You know, there's a lot of things we can, I can configure here, but I'm not going to change that much. I'm just going to perhaps change the initial cast from let's say 3.5 million, I'm going to change it to say 4 million. That's it, okay. So 4 million Australian dollars, everybody get that and then they can start doing their business. Uh, I don't wanna change the location. I don't wanna turn off or turn on any location. I'll just leave it as is. I'm gonna turn on uh, procurement. Uh, I got my finance, so finance, you cannot be turned off or then procurement, I'm gonna turn on retail. I'm turning on retail uh, and then Okay, I'm ready to go. Now here, I like to set up teams, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the, teach, it's the student that is coming to play. So I can set up a few teams, team one, and then team two, for example, right? Uh-huh, team two, and then team three, right? 
in three. Now, then I am going to bring in uh, the virtual, the robot. So earlier I mentioned that we have five robots, Anybot, Johnbot, Leanbot, Oxybot, and Paulbot. And uh, these are the uh, uh, players that can they have the intelligence to do some transaction based on the current business environment. So I'm going to put in two robots here and I'm going to put in one robot here. Uh, yep, uh, one robot here. And then I'm going to put in one robot here. Uh, and then I'm going to put uh, a virtual player here, this team four. So this is team human, team H, human. Uh, so this, I'm going to put in a virtual player. So the difference between robot and virtual learner is the learn virtual learner does not have the intelligence to do any transaction. So here we have do, re, mi, fa, so, five of them. So I'm going to select one of them here. So when we run this game, obviously team H is going to lose and become bankrupt because team H is not doing anything. But team one, team two, team three, there's robots, they will do transaction. Okay, so there you go, there you go with, all this, uh, 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 with all the setup. Now, in the event that we are not talking about robots and virtual learner, in the event that you guys, for example, are the learners, then I would have asked you to sign up, to sign in, register to this, to this game by giving you this uh, uh, what do you call it, game code. So if I give you a URL and then subsequently you go through a very sim few simple steps, then you will come in and your name will appear here, right? So I, at, at any one time, I can cater up to 100 students to play the game, uh, 10 teams maximum, and each team is maximum at 10 uh, uh, people. So 100 people can play this game all together. Um, but of course, we are, this is not a workshop, I'm just doing a demo, therefore I'm not, uh, inviting i'm not in i'm not going to invite you to to join this game uh through this through this method i'm just going to use the virtual learner and run this game so if i look at one of the learners for example if i take a look at this person's screen oxybot then there you go oxybot will be looking at this particular screen it's fairly simple for the beginning and then it will get complicated in the future as we turn on more and more features okay for example Look at the cash situation right now, all right? There's nothing here. But if I were to initialize this game, you will see that there is already a cash uh, appearing, 4 million, you see? So I have cash now, right? Before the game starts. So now, if as a player, I can also start browsing around, look at my location. So here are the area that I can operate in Adelaide, Brisbane, and so on. I can start renting a space, right? Uh, and then I can browse around. If I'm a learner, I can also look at the guide and there's a plenty of guide to guide me how to play this game. For example, I can look at what is my area utilization, how do I change the price, I can go to YouTube or PowerPoint. So these are all the active guide that's available to the learners. So. And the learner can also click one of these and go to a series of uh, tour guide. Okay, so these are the guides that will guide them along uh, what each and every the menus are, right? So every time the learner will see this little little eye, this will become the micro, uh, what do you call it, the tour guide, yeah? So uh, the learner can just go through this and browse and try to understand through all this little uh, tour guide. Plus, don't forget that we have this uh, virtual assistant. So the virtual assistant is actually going to guide them along, okay, as we can see later. So when I run this game, for example, if I run this game, I'm going to run for a very quick game. Then you will see that now the, the game has started, right? So what am I going to do, right? So here's the, the guide is telling me, right? You should set up your store because, you know, because you got money. So let's do something. So show me how to set up a store. So if I click show me, then it will actually tell me where to go, right? So that's, that's it, right? Enough hint for me. So I click this location and I say, ah, looks like I have these choices. So let's say I'm going to rent a, uh, a space in Hobart. So I'm just going ahead and rent a space in Hobart. And then if I go to, uh, uh, okay, I approve this, then my, my area will start showing up. Okay, so this is how a game gets started. This is how a game get registered. You see, I got Hobart and, and, and Adelaide. And the reason why Hobart and Adelaide came in because I'm actually taking, um, this is actually a robot. So the robot is actually doing the 
the the the, the business now. Okay, so it's actually uh, uh, taking over this business, and of course I can also uh, play along, but uh, actually I can leave it to the to the robot to do this. Now, this is how Monsoon Sim gets started. Okay, uh, let me just go back to the big picture. Once again, as a teacher, you set up the game, you let the players come in, come in, and then you run the game based on the scenario you select, and the teacher, the student will then go through the game and they play, okay? The student can go through all sorts of business analysis. They can look at their sales and they can look at their report, et cetera. So if the student wants to look at their, uh, their cost and their, for example, their sales and their uh, whatever, right? Mar price okay so these are all the internal built-in uh, business uh, uh, business charts right so they can download and they can do the analysis again this is a team game uh, the players can play against each other uh, uh, each other so this we have three teams one uh, four teams sorry right and then we have this chat right so the chat is very useful uh, particularly right now if I if I uh, allow the chat and that's the look at this. This is the chat room. So if I say to the student, okay, okay, game uh, will stop uh, in 30 minutes, let's say in 30 minutes, then the learners will see the chat here. And of course, they can also chat among their own team members. That uh, is that's more a little bit of privacy here. So they can chat um, with the team members. Okay, so we got the chat, we got this, we got the, uh, the what you call virtual assistant, we got the business intelligence, uh, and then we got all sorts of reports here. For example, you can look at the PNL and you can look at, uh, you can drill down and so on and so on. Okay, uh, you got the help here. This is your help, right? This is what we call active guide. Each and every um, module, they have their own active guide here. Okay, and then of course they can turn on multiple currency or multiple language if they want to. Uh, if they don't, they, they don't have to. Uh, let me just show you that if I want to turn the, all this into Mandarin, I can easily do that. Um, the whole thing will become Mandarin, okay? Uh, just go back to English. Um, there you go. Now, as a teacher, what, what else can I do, right? As a teacher, I can also uh, do observation. So for example, I can do observation, I can do observe here and click this and look at uh, all, you know, the uh, current sales situation, for example, okay? And I'll look at the sales revenue and then I'll look at the, uh, let's say utilization and I look at the margin. Let's suppose I do that, I do a half screen and here is, something that I can observe, right? So they are, so we're looking at four teams uh, and the robots are quite active. And of course the human are not doing anything. So team four is flat here, okay? So there you have it, right? So this is the uh, 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 observation. Now, I can also share with you the, uh, how to set the scoring metrics. So for example, here I can set the scoring metrics if I want to say edit the score, if I want to measure in you know measure the game success in in terms of net profit and cash on hand, I'll give them let's say sixty percent not net profit and cash on hand forty percent. Then here is the winner, team two, right? Now if I change the scoring metrics, of course then uh, there will be a new uh, uh, winners. Okay. Now earlier I mentioned that I have we have this course wizard. Wizard that's already pre-packaged for you, the entire uh, set of courses that will take you to entire one semester. Here, here they are, okay? So if I start this game from, from beginning, okay, reset it to zero, and I can click here and go to the course wizard and look at the uh, 101, 102, ERP 101, 102, 103, all the way to 114, okay? Now, it, these are the roadmap, so if I want to start let's say the first course, I click this, and then I get this presentation. Here I am, 101, and then I can go through this and get my, uh, the final, the, you know, the, 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 the final step. Uh, and then I can see that, okay, so I'm turning, I'm gonna turn on procurement, finance, and retail. Okay, so 
I'm, I, this is what uh, the students are expected to do. They expect to rent a store and so on and so on, and they expect to learn the following. Okay, so the uh, micro course is actually pre-packaged for you. All you have to do is just to click in front of the student and show them, okay? And then you go to next step, and that's it. You say, let's get the course started. So, so we're gonna set up the course. We're gonna use Australian baseline, and then we're gonna turn on these four modules, uh, and then we're gonna turn on the uh, virtual assistant, we're going to make holiday to, we're not going to play holiday for now for this particular course. And then we're going to set up some KPI target. So we're going to set the target. So next step. So all you have to do is really to click, 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 and then complete the whole setup. Right? Now let's check. Has the target been set up for us? Indeed, it has. So the course has actually helped me set up the entire game now. So all I have to do right now is to initialize the game and run it. So now the students are running at this particular, uh, this course. So that's it, right? So the, the students are running this course. Now, if I'm done with this, I'm gonna stop this. And if I am completed, with, I have completed this course, I wanna move on to the next course. All I have to do is to go to the next course. And let's say I'm going to the third course, 103. And then you will see that uh, slightly more, uh, right, so, these are the modules that will be turned on uh, marketing, the new, the new module. So at the end of this, uh, these courses, 114, all will be turned on, right? All will be turned on. So that's the micro course concept, okay? Now, what else should I cover? Okay, I covered the score by met, uh, score by target, score by metric, we'll do the observation, and then we can, data analytics will be covered by uh, Derek. So my name's Christine Contesotto. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Accounting uh, at Deakin University. I'm also the Associate Dean Teaching and Learning in our Faculty of Business and Law. And back when I started uh, teaching with Monsoon Sim, uh, this was absolutely new to me. I'd never used a simulation. I'd not played computer games. And I really was very dubious about the attributes of teaching this way. I'm now a complete convert. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we, uh, how we teach the unit in which the simulation is based, then talk about how we've introduced it and the, the way we use it, particularly around our assessment tasks, and then to talk about the difficulties that we experienced or, thought, or the challenges that we had to deal with before using the task, and then the real positives that have come out of it. And then obviously happy to ask questions at the end. So we teach uh, or use Monsoon Sim as part of our capstone experience. So the capstone experience is designed to help students bring their knowledge together. When we teach accounting, we tend to very much focus in the other units on how to follow accounting standards. So how do you do accounting? Debits, credits, following accounting standards, preparing very soloed type of transactions. Yet when students go out into the real world, we know they actually have to bring all their information together. And accountants do spend a lot of their time doing financial statements, but they also spend a lot of the time providing information for management. And management really wants strategy and advice on how their strategies are working. So we really felt it was important to bring accounting into a working organization, so to speak, so that they could see immediate impacts of decisions that they were making, both on the actions of the business and on the financial statements. So for example, you know, if you're competing in teams against competitors selling the same products as you, you have some pricing strategies. So you can choose to set your price high, you get a high gross margin per product, but then you would expect to sell less. As an alternative, on the other extreme, you can have very low margins, and set your price low and increase your quantity of sales. What is the better technique to enhance your profitability? And that's something we really wanted students to have to think about. And for, so for all the decisions that are made in a business, we wanted students to understand how the accountant can support that decision making and how the decisions can influence uh, financial um, statements, profitability, et cetera. So we really wanted students to, to action what they've learned in, in our whole course. So in our accounting course is part of our Bachelor of Commerce. So students have to take economics, law, finance, uh, data analytics, accounting, um, 
you know, as part of their course. So they have a broad range of commercial experience. We wanted to action all of their learning in that three year course. And then we want to, them to reflect on what they've learned and what they're actually doing. So we wanted to make it as authentic as possible. So to relate their discipline specific, their accounting knowledge to real activities. Now, of course, it's really hard to pick up your, you know, we would have two to 300 students a trimester. Really hard to pick them up and take them into an organisation, but really easy to give them that experience in a simulation like Monsoon Sim. So our other aim was to, to build a bridge between the final year of our undergraduate degree, employability, and lifelong learning. So we know from employers that we have uh, had focus groups with, they want students that can reflect, that look for information, that can problem solve, um, work as a team and communicate clearly. And to play Monsoon Sim well, to, to be a winner, the team's a winner, all those um, attributes have to be at play. And so our, our game really is derived to, to enhance students ability to use those graduate learning outcomes or, or soft skills or professional skills, however you'd like to call them. And so we really wanted to encourage the development of graduate capabilities that our employers were telling us they required um, from our students. So our capstone has three main components. So for the first three weeks, we really review accounting transactions in theory. So an overview of what they've done in the whole course from an accounting perspective. We then spend four weeks on the simulation and then we spend three weeks on case studies that we've had specifically developed for our students that have a strong focus on accounting, corporate governance, environmental issues, try and bring in sustainability, maybe some fraud issues. And we look at, uh, we take those cases from what's happening um, in the world. So we've had cases built around um, you know, a business collapse in Australia, which was the Dick Smith Group. We've had something around Volkswagen and their experiences with their environmental um, fraud. Um, we've done doing a case on the Royal Commission that's happened in Australia. So trying to keep it very, very focused. And the simulation informs students of how different decisions being made play out in, in the cases as well. So it, the simulation leads very nicely into the cases because they've seen a holistic uh, picture. So what did we want from the simulation? We really wanted students to start thinking about not just accounting. Accounting is a tool used in business. We are not, accountants are not the be and end all of a business, we are a support. So what information should we be generating? How should we be generating it? What information should we provide to management? And so we really wanted them to understand the impact of various business strategic decisions on financial statements. We wanted them to understand there is a relationship between management accounting, financial accounting, but also on the decisions you make around human resources, procurement and marketing. So that it's just not accounting there on its own. It, it has this whole player impact. We wanted them to realize that in a business environment, you're not dealing with one issue at a time. There is a multitude of things happening in a business. And Abdi showed you the really small start when there's just retail stores. And as the game gets more complex, there are so many decisions and things happening that the team has to realize they're juggling a lot of decisions and they can't just play in one little accounting space. So it really does make them open their eyes up to what the world's like. It does, we did want them to learn to work effectively in a team. I'm sure many of us have had the same experience. We force group work for students in assessment tasks and we try and develop it in classes. There's often a, lot, a lack of engagement with students. They would prefer to do stuff on their own. They don't want to have to liaise. They don't want to have to assess um, their teammates' strengths and weaknesses. They'd rather just do it themselves. Um, and so we, we really wanted to force students to have to work on it in a team. And finally, we wanted them to start strategizing and problem solving. So, you know, my business is not making the right, as much profit as my competitor. What could I do differently to try and change that situation? So um, we really wanted them to have to draw on a lot of their, their skills. So how, so what do we do? We have students work in teams of five to run businesses that compete against each other. 
we start in the first week of running um, the game just to get them to learn. We throw students in the deep end, which was the recommended learning by Abdi when we, we started this. The students flounder for about three or four minutes. Then they realise they've got to do something and they actually start doing something. And they play for a little while as solo agents because at the very early part of the simulation, you don't need teamwork. But in about 15 to 20 minutes, as we ramp up the complexity, these students start to work as a team very effectively. So each week we do a more complex configuration of the game in, and each week we make the game faster. So, um, and it goes incredibly fast when it's a 15 second day. What we felt was most important for our students learning was that we would provide regular breaks for team strategy meetings. So we actually run the game for however many days. We stop the game. We ask students, what information would you like? And they might say, we'd like to see what our retail sales are. So we would allow them to compare their sales with their competitors, the other team's uh, sales. Uh, they might not want to know their gross margin. They want to, might want to know how many stock outs they had. So we start sort of with encouraging them um, as to which reports might be useful for the stage of the game we're at. But by the week four, they're telling me, show me this, I need this information. We also made it competitive so that we would announce a winner every game. Uh, so the students had something to strive for. And we also expected them to, to improve their, their performance every week of their business. We did have a new game start each week um, that we taught this because we felt it was really important that if a team bombed in one week, they had the opportunity to learn from that and to come back strongly the following week. Whereas if we'd kept the same game going, there's less incentive for them to come back in the following week. So we actually, in most of our classes, have nine teams competing against each other. So the difficulties that we um, have had to face and which we um, experienced and which we've learned to deal with was firstly how to ensure the students realise the learning. So we weren't explicit enough with students initially in what they were learning. We could tell they were learning because we could see their performance enhancing. And in the assessment tasks, we could see real uh, reflection and strategizing. So we really had to encourage students around what they were learning. So we're now quite explicit at the beginning of each class. These are the modules. This is what you're taking from these modules. This is how you can, um, or, you know, what you're tying together in this process. After we've run the game, uh, we would have students, uh, so three teams per week, uh, would present on specific questions around their strategy, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, how they would change their team performance moving forward, and so that all teams could hear what others were doing. So we required them in the assessment tasks to reflect and to take initiatives to actually report back onto us that this didn't work and later we tried this and it did work. So that we wanted to see and for them to document for us how they progressed in their learning and their thinking about how to run this business. Um, and then at the end of the class, we started recapping. Hey, let's look at the key takeaways you've told us you've got. So the learning became really explicit. To help students realise the learning, the assessment tasks are really important. We've put a lot of thought into those and also discussing the learning. So actually bringing it to their attention. The other difficulty we had um, that um, our university or my university, and I think most Australian universities have rules around um, external marks, you know, assessment marks being held by external parties. So we had to create assessment that was outside of the monsoon sim game for marking and uh, so that it's recorded on our, on our own learning management system. There are um, multiple choice quizzes built into the, the simulation. We've chosen not to use them because that's a form of marking. So that's not the path we went down. So our assessment, we created three different assessment tasks. Uh, the first one, sorry, I've gone out of that. The first one was a professional mark each week. So we run the game for four weeks. We said each week you come, you get two and a half marks per week. 
to be a professional person, it means you come to work on time. So you are there ready to start your simulation on time. It means that you're not on your phone because you're at work running your business. It means that when we have a break, that you're back from the break on a timely basis. It means that you're working on the game and you're working with your team members so that we're really rewarding them for working as a team. And we, so that's 10 marks of the 10% of the overall result. And that was really to, to enhance the professional skills. And the students, you know, two, two wrong moves and you're out. So if you come to class and you haven't done the pre-reading and you're not prepared to play this game, you've lost one and a half marks of your two and a half professionalism marks this week. If you take a, you know, call on your phone, you've got no marks. You know, so we're really in, in trying to emphasize that you need to be a professional when you're an accountant. We have a group presentation. This happens, each group presents once. They get the questions a week in advance. The questions are particularly related to the new modules we introduce into the game. So that we, the students play the game. They have 10 minutes to prepare their presentation and then 10 minutes to present. So it's very action packed and it requires them to be thinking about what they're doing as the game progresses. And then finally, after the we've done the four weeks, students are required to write a report, again, as a group, around their business performance and strategy. And we have different questions every trimester to ensure they don't um, get support from students who've done it in prior trimesters. And there's just so much in the game that we can query. So this trimester, I'm really focused around management accounting and you know, direct costing versus absorption costing, so that they need to use the data in, in the game. In other, other trimesters, we focus perhaps on other things. So how did we feel? Really nervous. The first time we ran, ran it, we were really nervous. We weren't sure what students would do. We were very nervous about how robust the software is. We we're unsure about what our CLAD students do. So in, the, in Deacon, we have pre-COVID-19, we had a lot of cloud students who don't tend to come to class on time. So we were really worried about how they would act being forced to come in and join a game at a specific time. And we really felt that we we're under pressure to capture students who arrived late and unprepared and get them functional fast. So we felt really nervous. I must say the support we were given um, from Abdi in particular, but was just brilliant. So we were never alone. Um, and if I, I send out a phone call, or an email, I get a very prompt response. So what did we find? Students were incredibly competitive. I couldn't believe how quickly they got on board to actually um, play this simulation and try to win. They just weren't filling in time. They were very, very motivated. The team decision-making was essential and they quickly, I've never seen it before, started communicating and working in their teams. So I've been a teacher for more years than I admit to now. I've never seen teamwork like I've seen it in this game and it becomes, the teams become very strong. And we forced them to stay in the same team for four weeks because they've got to write a report. And after that four weeks, when we move on to the case studies, they can go into different teams. It's incredibly rare for a team to break up. They become really committed. Uh, the professional assessment marks surely motivated the students to fully participate and the students thought it was great fun. You know, the feedback is always positive. Um, our cloud students came on board. From our perspective as lecturers, the first week of the game feels chaotic. So you just, you throw the students in, they're, they're learning, we're trying to help them, but it takes about, I don't know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and all of a sudden you're going, actually, this is working. By the time we get to week three and four, I might as well not be in the, in the room. The students just run this themselves. They ask for strategy breaks. If we want to cut it off too soon, they're asking for it to be extended to the time they want. So it's really positive and empowering for students. So we were very, very happy. Students worked well. Uh, we became, you know, just the person that started the game off for them really and showed them some, some graphs and stuff. They really ran it and, and led their learning. So we were surprised at how um, well students saw interact interrelationship between businesses and how hard they work to really improve their strategy. We've had great support. And what I found um, is that Monsoon Sim continually involves. So every time we come to it, there's something new that we can explore. We don't always choose to use it in our, our classes, but we can mix it up where, um, every trimester uh, when we want to. 
Uh, the negatives, well, we had to spend some time to learn the simulation. I learned it four years ago now, so it's not a huge commitment for my time. I maybe spend two or three hours um, in the year when there's updates, um, but really now it's just built in knowledge for me. New teaching staff are really nervous about the game, but we've learned how to support them. And so we've got enough established people that can now do it. It's, we've got to establish the games for each class. Uh, I set up yesterday uh, 16 games for 16 classes. Um, it took me about an hour. So again, it's not huge. We do need to make sure we're on top of the regular updates. Um, that's not hard. Uh, we do a webinar. Um, and so when we've got new teachers, we tend to have two teachers in the room for the first 30 to 45 minutes just as a support. Some feedback from the student. And, you know, obviously I've picked good feedback, but, you know, I must say 99% of feedback from students is incredibly positive. I love the game. I learn a lot. I realise where I fit best into a team. I learned how to communicate kindly and under pressure. You know, I enjoyed the game. It was an interesting. Actually think it should be used earlier in our degrees. Shows how financial information changes and how it affects business results. You know, it would be great. You know, it's a great opportunity to make the right decision and how your, you know, decision affects. The only negative feedback we've had is that some students tell us um, they, didn't, um, they didn't think they learnt anything. And some students have said four weeks is too long. Um, we don't agree. We think we get four weeks worth of value. Um, just before I do the, um, my, the questions, just as an aside, away from our classes, we have also used this um, when we have students visit the university. So I have run this game with year nine students. So they're 15 years old, no business experience. They've run this game and really also understood. You know, we've, we've done it at the less complex end, but they've really understood and made some really good decisions. Uh, we also use it when we have open days to so, show students what a great university deacon is. And it always goes down really well. So I don't know how long I've taken, but hopefully not too long. So happy to answer any questions. Hey, so my name is Hossein, Dr. Hossein. I'm from, from Malaysia. Yep. I'm a senior lecturer here in uh, yep. UUM, School of Technology Management and Logistics. Just uh, I would like to ask regarding the activities and assessment, which is the most core part that you yes. just presented now. Questions come to my mind that these on hours is uh, four weeks. So we spend four weeks and we have a three hour class in that four weeks uh, each week. So we do this for 12 hours, but some of that time is spent on um, presentation. So in most weeks we would play the game for an hour and 45 minutes to two hours, um, breaking it up for strategy breaks, for example. Uh, and then we would have an hour of students preparing and then undertaking their presentations. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Christina. Uh, Christian, uh, this is Mohammed. I am from Melbourne. Hello. I have a question to you. You know, uh, how long it takes you to, you know, comprehend this game? Because we have to be an expert to teach or uh, to run these two students. No, you know, I, I, expert is a really strong word. Um, so the first time we we actually learnt the game. Uh, we did it really comprehensively. And so Abdi came down and spent two days at our university with a number of us and we did different things. So the first day we just chose to play the game. So we really had an understanding of it from a user perspective. Uh, so that was fun. You know, it didn't feel like training. The second day we learned how to set the games up. And in all honesty, maybe that was four hours of solid work. Um, but we did it and we played games and we, we had a lot of fun and we supported each other. Now that, so that was my investment, I guess. Um, and so I became a certified trainer from, from that training. So now that, so that was the first time. The time, the other, when you set up the game the first time, it takes you uh, some time because you're learning where to find the different things you want to switch on and off. And you're looking at the different alternatives that you have. Now I'm really experienced in this. And I pretty much know what the key things I want to do are. So realistically, I would think if I spent three hours in the whole year learning, uh, you know, up, upskilling, um, that would be the max. 
So normally each time there's an upgrade, Abdi would offer us a webinar. It normally goes for around an hour. He does some demos. Uh, we look and we ask questions. And then after that, we make an assessment about which parts we may or may not want to bring in to our classes. But it really is not a huge time commitment. It is much easier, much easier than it looks when you, you see it. And I can tell you, it's really robust. I was doing this, um, I was um, leading a game, running a game, and I made a mistake and I actually closed um, my browser and so closed down the game. Realised quickly, went straight back in and the game just started seamlessly. And the student said to me, oh, it seemed to stop for a second. I said, goodness, that's strange. And, and we just went on. It's incredibly robust and f incredibly forgiving. So, um, I, I really would say, and I'm not, you know, I'm a lot older than a lot of people. I'm not used to playing computer games. I wouldn't say I was a computer whiz. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Abdi, maybe it's back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, 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 good. Now, look, look at the game that I just ran just now, right? So, the game has stopped on day 80. Remember, we started day eight, uh, 80 days of games. And then uh, let's take a look at uh, what happened. Uh, so, yep. So, these people are, okay. So, this team is going for how many retail store? One, two, three, four, five. So, this robot is going for retail stores. And the robot has generated 25 millions in sales and so on and get some nice profit and so on and how many transactions that they have conducted so far close to well 250 transactions uh and what have they done let's take a look they have they've done purchases uh, good purchase and rental management they have set the price they've done the marketing investment and they've set whatever some preferred vendor so uh and i can take a look at their uh their uh, profit and loss statement and so on right now what I like to point out right now is that this data, okay, from all these teams is now uh, accessible uh, through live access, okay, in data and analytics. And this is where I'll pass to uh, Derek. Derek, are you ready? Because I'm going to give you the credentials, the login, so that you can uh, access the data of this game. Hi, Abby. You ready? Can you, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, you you, I'll, I'll, I'll save that for the end if there's time to do the, the live connection to show how people um, can, can do okay. that and how straightforward it is. But you can go ahead and just put the connection details in the chat if you want and I'll, I'll pick them up. Okay, well, I'm going to give you the, uh, so I'm going to set up the uh, user access and there you go. So these are the uh, access. So I'm going to put uh, so here's the, I'm going to um, copy this and send the, uh, send this over to you through WhatsApp. So you can now log in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to send it to you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to dive straight into that now. I'll do it. I'll do it later. Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. So. Um, data analytics, definitely something that's continues to up the list of um, in, in demand skills, skills for the 21st century. Um, and as Christine was mentioning before, it's becoming more important for business students to take on this role of advisors and decision makers and not just counting the beans, right? Um, and so data analytics definitely plays a role in that. Um, as technology becomes uh, cheaper and storing vast volumes of data becomes easier um, and almost negligible cost, um, access to this data to support decision-making and, and being able to take advantage of that um, information is definitely something that prospective employers are increasingly looking for um, in graduates. Just a little bit about me. Um, so I've been a long time gamer, probably played my first computer game when I was about nine years old. Um, 
been working in the gaming and simulation space. Some of you perhaps may know me from my days over at the uh, HEC guys in Montreal with the SAP simulation. Um, so worked a lot on that and I've been a long time um, collaborator with Abdi. And more recently, sort of the last five years, I've really turned my attention to this whole um, data and, and analytics piece. So just to frame really what's all that is about, I really like this um, quote from Puget here. And the emphasis really is, it's not about just creating some graphs or running some numbers um, on the data, right? Which is sort of, again, that accounting perspective like that Christine was mentioning. It's, we've got to do a lot more these days than just add up the numbers, right? It's all about making decisions and it's all about supporting decision making. Or what do we mean by support, right? And so there's another perspective here that Gartner has, which is the level of sophistication of um, your analytics effort. And it's a large part here of what's in blue is what we're getting um, technology to do, what we're getting the software to do. And what's over here in green is what we still want human minds to accomplish, right? They make this end decision. And sometimes people and students um, have a, a focus that they, they forget about, you know, using their own brains, their own critical thinking in this piece and just expect somehow um, that they'll be able to use this, this technology to tell them what to do. And it's not really about that. It is about developing perspective on what's happening, interpreting that, um, and then informing that to say, well, perhaps we should try X, do that experiment, and then see how it goes, right? And this is sort of really the cycle that we want, that they learn to think for themselves, learn to investigate, learn to experiment, and then learn to measure the outcomes um, of those experiments in this decision-making um, context. And so the, the purpose of the analysis is very important. It's very easy to give somebody some data and some tools and say, go off and create some charts and they'll, they'll go and do it. But then those charts aren't necessarily meaningful and they aren't there to aid decision-making because unless you understand exactly what the decisions are that we're looking to support, um, you're not gonna be able to create anything particularly helpful or, or anything particularly meaningful, right? And so ideally, if you want to add analytics to your curriculum, and again, it depends on how much space you want to give it and what your learning outcomes might be and how deep you want the students to go down the rabbit hole or whether you just want to give them a brief interaction um, with a tool like Tableau or Power, D Power BI or even Excel and Power Pivot um, in Excel to do a little bit of data crunching um, just to see what it's about. So from a light outcome to a deep outcome, um, but what I'm going to be really spending more time on here is if you if you want those outcomes to be a bit more deeper, getting students really to think critically, think for themselves, um, then this is how we we can support them. So ideally, we'd, we'd we'd want the students to sort of experience all of these, right? And if we go back to the Gartner one, a lot of the time the basic stuff is just well, you know what happened, right? So I create a line chart and I see the line went down. And so I interpret that as that that's a, a poor outcome and, and well, end of story, right? And so, well, could we have done, why, why did it happen? Why did it go down? What were the factors that were influencing our revenue to go down, for example, right? Um, did it go down consistently or was there a period of significant, you know, downward, downward trends um, in, in, in the revenues that, you know, we were accumulating through, through, through the year or whatever, right? So, well, why did that happen? And, and, you know, could we have seen it? Could we have foreseen it, right? Was there some sort of indicator as a month or two before that would have given us a clue that that was about to happen to us so that we could have taken some sort of intervention um, uh, to prepare for that, limit the effects of that, or, you know, even possibly avoid it or, or turn that situation around um, or to our competitive um, advantage. And so that's really what this purpose of the analytics is all about. Looking for these trends, looking for patterns, um, setting ourselves up to be in the best position um, to prevent um, unfavorable outcomes and promote favorable outcomes 
based on our predictions and the trends and patterns that, that we're observing, all action through the decisions um, that we take. And so, you know, this question of purpose really comes around a framing of, of questions. And this is something that students are typically weak at in terms of how do you frame a good question, right? So I put this example up here. This is one of the slides that I use in my data analytics class. What is the best car, right? And it sounds like a, an innocent enough question, but best is very vague and in what context, right? So if it's which car is gonna do the fastest lap around Albert Park here in Melbourne, driven by a professional racing driver, well, we can pick which car it's going to be, right? But if the context is which one gets my 80 year old grandmother safely to the supermarket and back once a week just to get her groceries, it's not gonna be the Formula One car, right? Um, what about if, you know, there's budget constraints, right? So this whole context of what do we mean by best in what situation, um, you know, based on who's performing um, the task, what is, what is the outcome, what's the objective? And so depending on that framing, each one of these could be the correct answer, right? Um, on what is the, the best car, not necessarily what is um, just the fastest on, on a racetrack, for example. So I like to present sort of this three-legged stool here because everybody thinks about, ah, oh, yeah, we need, you know, fancy software and obviously we need data and then we can go off and do our analysis, right? But the three-legged stool, the metaphor here is without one of those three legs, basically you've got nothing to sit on, right? It's not stable. And so we can't forget um, this, this purpose leg over here and a well-developed understanding of what is it that we're trying to do? What are the decisions that we're trying to support? So a little bit about visualization. This is really trying to take some abstract information and display that in some way that leads us to develop a deeper perception of those things we were looking for before, right? Understand what's happening in the world around us, predicting events, looking for trends and patterns, doing forecastings um, and things like this, right? And so it's really this question of taking some data, visually encoding, which really means create some sort of charts and things like that. Um, but charts have to be interpreted. And so there's also this human perception involved in understanding what you're looking at. And again, context matters. Um, line chart, line going up, line going down, good or bad. Well, it depends if it's cost or if it's revenue, we can um, interpret that differently, right? And so the, the perception has to be also anchored um, in, in, a, in a context about the phenomenon, right? So where is the data? What, what, is it, what is it measuring? What are we looking at? So that we can also interpret this line chart, um, whether that means, you know, it's a good thing or, or a bad thing, right? And so once again, you know, here, Stephen Few, um, who was a, a pioneer in modern visualization, um, software visualization techniques, really, again, coming down this understanding for action this is that same principle of supporting decision-making um, that we've been discussing. So not all charts are created equal, which is why if you read my bio, I've got this little joke there about being on a mission to kill the pie chart. Um, because this is one of my slides from my class that as you can see, um, basically the way that our eyes and our brain processes visual information, not everything is created equal. And there's different levels of accuracy, right? Um, and so we can detect subtle differences in the position of things and the lengths of things. But when we get down to slopes and angles um, and areas and, and volumes um, and, and shades and things like that, the accuracy of our perception um, falls off. Now students find this all very theoretical and sort of yeah, yeah, blah, blah. And so what I do is I give them two quizzes. Before I teach them anything about visualization, I give them two quizzes. Same data, very similar questions. The only thing is I change the type of charts. And when I show them these results, they're quite astonished at just how badly they do with typical pie charts for things. And when you've got more appropriate things like even simple bar charts that they take for granted as boring, um, just how much um, more effective and you see even the average time to take the quiz goes down, right? So the entire class gets a, a, a much better result um, in two minutes uh, less, right? And so then they start to pick up the interest like, oh, okay, there's, there's something here. Um, this is worth learning about um, in effective visualization techniques, choosing the right chart um, for the right job. Which brings me to, whoops, sorry. I got my slides slightly out of order here. Um, this gentleman here, I learned a great deal from his blog um, about visualization. 
He has this thing called the junk, junk charts. And he really proposes that there's this three, uh, there's this three elements here, and the interaction of these three elements is extremely important. And he is once again placing the emphasis on understanding the purpose of what it is that you're trying to do, what is the question that you're trying to inform, um, what are the decisions that you're trying to improve your performance when making those decisions or optimize um, those decisions. And so there's this interaction between do you really understand the question? Do you really understand what your objective is? Um, do you have the right data to inform that question? You can always go and look at data that's not relevant, right? Or data that, that's slightly uh, distorted or missing a certain perspective, right? We can look at different data, different perspectives to try and get multiple perspectives on the same question to deepen our understanding. Um, and then, you know, what does the chart say? Which is basically how have we chosen to visualize the data? And so there's a lot of focus that tends to be just on the bottom two here, right? Oh, we've got some data, let's create some charts. And hopefully it's going to give us some insight or tell us something. That's really the wrong way to think about it. It really should be what is the question? What is the data I need to answer the question? And then what is the best way to visualize some data to be able to give me the easiest, quickest, most reliable perspective um, on that gives me insight into, uh, into that question? A little bit about uh, software aided visualization. So tools like Tableau and Power BI and, and, and others have come a long way. In, in the past, there was a lot of, well, I got some data and then that would be put into a report and that report would then be presented as a, a PowerPoint static um, or uh, sent out as a paper, you know, printed or a PDF, right? Um, and there's no interaction with this, right? And so if we want to deepen our understanding of what's happening in the world and the data, we need to interact. We need to interact with the data to gain different perspectives and also interact with the visualizations. Now I'll show you what that means uh, when I come to do the live demo and what, the, what we really mean by interacting with the visualization to deepen our understanding, but really explore the data in different ways, looking at it from different perspectives to truly understand what is being measured in the context that we are looking to, um, to influence. And so this reinforces a, a few very old um, sort of learning models. And these came out of not education in a formal sense, but more institutional learning. They were fairly well known with Kolb and Aguris, basically you know, the double loop learning and Kolb's learning cycle, which is, you know, how do people go out there and, and sort of learn in the wild? And, we're going to bring that into the classroom and let's sort of think about how these sort of might work in a typical classroom experience where let's say you want to teach data analytics and you're going to do that with some sort of a case study, right? So there's a case that has some background story to give the students their context. Um, you give them there's some data associated with that and then they're asked to perform an analysis and make a recommendation, right? And if you think about that, there's no real concrete experience in this, in this, this concept, there's possibly not a lot of observation and reflection. And mostly we start off with whatever the, the subject is that's being taught, the teacher is going to influence and impart um, their wisdom and, and basically a lot of the concepts, which the students are then asked to apply in a new situation, i.e. the case study, apply what they've learned to the case study um, to then produce an analysis and a recommendation, which doesn't feed back into concrete experience or any kind of observation and reflection. It goes straight to basically some feedback from the teacher and that's it. And so there's a, a, a quite a high reliance here on the formation of understanding of, of the world and what's happening, um, relies on the teacher imparting that knowledge. And then whether the student has learned those concepts or not relies also on the teacher providing feedback. And so as soon as the student is removed from the classroom and put in the real world, they have to make quite a large leap to then be able to do that themselves without being guided by the mentor um, of the teacher. So if you look at the Agaris model on, um, on the right, so this idea that what was I was talking about before, that we want students to formulate their own hypothesis, um, formulate their own mental models about the world rather than be just given that um, by the teacher, experiment with decisions and then be able to reflect for themselves, not with a, with a teacher's expert guidance, but to reflect themselves whether they made a good decision or a bad decision, right? 
And so this is where something like a simulation becomes a lot more interesting because the nature of the simulation is you are repeatedly making decisions over and over again. And then you're given the tools or you're given at least in, in the simulation, for example, the, um, the, the teacher gets to decide on the scoring metric. Um, and so at least you get this from the score, but then you have to deepen your understanding of how your decisions affected a variety of factors that led to you getting, in essence, that score in the game. Let's say it's you know, the maximum um, net profit, um, et cetera. So this offers the potential. And again, the same, it's not real world concrete experience, but you're getting the experience um, that's simulated experience, right? And we talk about this in the, in the gamification, what we call the suspension of disbelief, right? But the students forget that they're playing something that's fake. For them, it's real, right? They really start to believe that they're in it and it's really their business and they care about that business. Um, and as Christine was mentioning, some of them can get quite competitive as in they want to be the best, right? And so they're highly engaged and they're highly driven. But there's one um, aspect of simulations that we have to think about is there's a lot of reflection going over here. And for this to really work, the students really need time to think. They need time to reflect, they need time to observe, perceive, um, and when you're running something in a simulation that has accelerated time, um, they often feel extremely under pressure to make decisions extremely fast. Um, and so you shortcut the reflection. So they're not often given the, uh, enough time to really reflect. Um, and so what happens is the decision making becomes quite tactical. And when you substitute a simulation um, instead, and when we did this in the early days, we thought, oh yeah, we give them the tool, we give them the data from the game, um, and we don't need to really spend too much time on the, the purpose. Um, the, the game is the purpose, right? Win, 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 win the game or perform well in the game, that's your purpose and the students will figure out for themselves. They can't. The amount of reflection and critical, the, the skills development that's happening all through here while they're learning the game, they're learning the business, they're learning how to figure out detect feedback for themselves, find problems. It's, it's, it's a lot, and it's a lot to expect them to do um, just on their own without help. So if you really want to go deep and really get them to understand what is decision-making, how these tools can support decision-making, you've got to do more than just give them some software, give them the data, and then you know, let them figure out the right questions, right? It doesn't really work. Because what happens is, this is the outcome that you usually sort of get, right? Students get so focused on, I've got seconds to make a decision. They become extremely tactically focused and basically the game turns into um, this sort of whack-a-mole type thing, right? Where basically they're just looking for problems and as soon as the problem rears its head, they, they, they whack it, right? And if you think about the scoring for whack-a-mole, that's exactly how you score. You hit, you, you know, you hit a mole on the head, you score one point. And so the students are highly engaged, they're having fun. It's fun, it's chaotic. Um, and I think they're doing a good job because basically every time you whack a problem on the head, you score, you score a point. So they think they're doing well. But that doesn't really translate into the real world or even the simulation because basically avoiding problems actually scores you more points. Um, the moles that you don't whack actually um, cost you negative points, right? And so we've got to get them out of this mode of whacking problems on the head and start thinking about how can I prevent these problems in the first place? How can I predict where the mole is gonna pop up, right? So that I'm ready and there with, with, with a plan to deal with it. And so you gotta start thinking about, well, the ones that you miss actually score you negative points. Um, and basically the longer the mole is up there, the, the more negative points you score, right? And so you've gotta get them to re-engage and rethink out of this tech tactical mode. So three things that basically students need for success. Um, in my many years of running simulations and trying to put analytic curriculums on top of that is you've got to give the students time to reflect. And we've tried that in a few different ways. Slow the game down, run the game more slowly. But the problem with that is um, if the game runs two, three minutes a day or something like that, it's still not enough time to really reflect. And then you've got this long cycle of students waiting for something to happen um, after they've made the decision and, and it feels too slow and they disengage and they get bored. So your incentive then, and, and also you, you want to generate data and have, have the game going and move forward. So slower you run the game, the more students disengage. Faster you run the game, the more it goes back to whack-a-mole. 
Um, and so my recommendation for the solution to this is let them play the game, short bursts, fast, learn something, but then go and reflect, right? Go analyze the data, go look at your decisions, go determine whether you have made good decisions or poor decisions. You're out of the game context. Here you're investing in understanding what you did before to learn how to basically play the game again a second time and do better, right? Um, coaching, you need lots of coaching. Now, not, not so much about how to use the software um, or even how to create you know, good visualizations. What students mostly need coaching around is the formulation of the right questions, right? So I'll walk around class and I'll see somebody has you know, a typical market share pie chart up on the screen, looking at it and going, okay, so that's interesting. So what's it telling you? Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, of the business decisions that you've got to make in running this company, um, what's, what is it telling you what to do? Well, what do you mean? Well, what are your decisions? Well, I don't know, pricing. Okay, so did you change your price recently? Oh, uh, yeah, we actually dropped it a few days ago. Okay, so what does this pie chart tell you about whether that was the right decision? Did you have dropped your price or not? How much did you drop it by? Was it too much? Was it too little? And they look at it and they go, I, I don't know. And this is where you have to intervene and you've got to tell them that it's not the tool's fault. It's not, oh, I don't get this. This is dumb. This doesn't have any value. Let me just go back to whack-a-mole. Is you've got to coach them that they're not asking the right questions. They're not thinking about the questions that they want answered, which is, well, what visualization do you and data do you need to answer the question of the price change I made five days ago? Did it have the effect that I wanted? Did it promote the outcome that I was looking for? What was my goal in dropping the price? I wanted to increase my sales and the revenue. Well, did that happen or not, right? And so you've got to coach them in this reflective exercise of how they formulate the questions to then get them to thinking about, ah, okay, the visualization that I would need and the data that I would need to answer that question is this, rather than just, I got some data I created in chart and then I don't know what to do with it. That doesn't mean anything to me, right? And the other thing is it takes a lot of time and, and a lot of skill in my experience, a lot of practice. And so you've got to give them lots and lots of examples. Um, and so one of the key things that I would do is best way um, to get them engaged in the example is when you are at some pause point or some reflection point where you're going to discuss their performance is to actually use the analytics tool um, and to create things for yourself ahead of time that you use in the debrief, right? And so here's an example of a dashboard created with Tableau um, that's sitting on top of uh, live real data um, from, from the, the game, plugs in. And so, you know, at some point you just, you, you refresh this, takes a few seconds, and here you can then start to debrief with the students. Well, okay, so, you know, which team is doing the best? Well, this blue team over here has the highest revenue. And, you know, that you can see from the line that their, their performance has been consistently, right? They've been consistently outperforming the other teams, right? Now, this is robots playing the game. So the robots are actually pretty good. Um, and so there's less chance here, but for most player generated stuff, you would often see that the, these lines stall and you're like, well, what was happening over here? You're like, how do we interpret this flat line? Uh, well, that means we, weren't, we didn't get any revenue for 10 days. Okay, so what was happening during that 10 pay, did they period that would have caused that, right? And so you start to bring into them in your debrief, discussing and showing um, the performance. So informing them on the kind of things to look for and, and the way that they can use the visualization um, tool to look at that. Now you've got to do this in a way that you, you're giving them perspective that they don't already have. So recreating things that are already available in the simulation reports itself is not really worth it because they're like, well, we've already got that, right? So you, and a lot of the things that the students don't focus on and they don't necessarily have or see in the simulation is um, performance over time, how situations change over time. And so in, in sort of a debrief like this, I'll always try and have a lot of charts in here that show things over time to draw back to uh, go and reflect. This is interesting. What was happening in this period? What, what, what happened here that caused this spike? There's another spike over here, right? It seems that all the teams were affected. What was happening in the market? So here we see total market revenues. So ah, it seems that demand is not even. Um, so what does that mean for inventory planning if our sales are not steady and we've got some days um, where, you know, where sales spike. Um, how do we prepare for that? Maybe we should, you know, carry some extra inventory. Can we forecast or predict, is there a pattern to how often 
you know, these spikes happen, right? And so you start to engage with this conversation and get them thinking um, on, on what to do. So I'll just flip over here to the live version of that. So just to show you, and this is what I mean by interactions, I actually changed this one up a bit um, to show the, the, the revenue of the, the different teams uh, here. But when we're talking about this, this idea of interacting with the data, interacting with the visualization, just say, okay, this is all very interesting, but what if I want to look at, um, you know, all, all like Mel Melbourne here seems to have, you know, pretty, pretty good sales, right? And so got this little heat map here that basically shows um, where the bigger markets are, right? So, okay, there seems to be a lot more um, revenue being earned in Melbourne. And so this is the power of tools like Tableau, where now you can click on something and you get this interaction where I've selected Melbourne and it's now filtered all the other charts, right? So now I'm looking at basically the inventory of each of the teams over time, um, specifically in Melbourne for the various three products, looking at revenues just for Melbourne, um, and basically the teams um, earn revenue fairly evenly in this, in this big market. And let's go have a look at say something like Sydney. And so here we discover, oh, now look, there's only two teams, right? So only two teams are operating in this location. So maybe there's an opportunity there. Um, there's not that much competition. So teams might think, oh, maybe we, you know, that, that's a good spot to go and open another location um, versus somewhere else. Um, like Brisbane, where I don't know everybody's already there. And so they start to formulate, oh, what should we do? What's what sort of sort of the strategy should be? And then what's really fun is they'll make their decision and think, ah, oh, you know, we've got it, we've got it, ha, oh, you know. But they don't realize that every other team has discovered the same thing. Um, and so they rush in and they get the out because they look at the outcome and they go, oh, that didn't work. And you ask them why. And and so this is the aspect of replicating what's happening in the real world. And the quote that Abdi put up from um, the American professor before, there's a line there that he didn't have, but decisions don't just operate in this vacuum, right? At a point in time, you make the decision. Other people are also looking at things and they're making the decisions at the same time. And so you could find that all the teams discover, oh, there's an opportunity here. So they all go and open locations there because they all see the same opportunity. And so the decision that you think was awesome and was going to do you great, well, everybody also saw the same opportunity and did that too, right? And so this is this other reflection of, yeah, okay, it's not just me. I've got to find something and I've got to get myself in a situation where it's not just finding the secret recipe or the, or the secret ingredient. It's I've got to do everything better everywhere all the time than all the other teams um, to truly be competitive. Um, so quite fond of the heat map thing in, in terms of, you know, selecting a particular product, filtering the other charts, or even down to a single cell. It's a really nice compact uh, summary way of, of showing how revenues are broken up in, a, in, in the market. Um, a lot more density of data than a pie chart and much more easier to interpret. And then also gives us this really nice way of interacting and drilling down into the segments to see, oh, well, there's only two teams um, serving this particular product in this particular market. Um, how's it going? Who's doing better? Um, generally, you'll see, especially in the early stages, as, as people still learning the game, uh, that you'll see flat lines over here with basically people running out of stock all the time. And so you reinforce their focus away from things like, oh, it's all about pricing, and start thinking about, well, having a sale with no product to sell isn't going to get you anywhere, right? So you've got to think about your supply chain, you've got to think about inventory planning. Um, the things that don't necessarily come naturally to them because they're not, th those things are not always fun and, and they, don't, they don't immediately think of them. Oh, how do I increase sales? Decrease my price, right? That's this mental model that they have. Well, how do you increase sales? Actually, don't change your price, buy more stock and buy it sooner, right? And so this is the kind of reflection um, and the sort of critical thinking and, and the loops and, and the understanding of the game that we want them um, to develop. And so I'll just put up uh, one last slide, which is this one over here, which is basically we want them to really do Whoops, sorry. It's all of this simultaneously, right? So as they're learning to understand the phenomenon of the game better, as they're learning to understand 
their mental model of how that works, their ability to influence outcomes, how the outcomes are being measurement, measured in the data that's being collected, how they choose to show those to inform them on whether their decisions are good or not. At the same time, learning about creating visual, visual, better visualizations, learning about being more selective about choosing the right data to um, give them the impression of whether the decisions that they're making are any good, and the framing of the question, right? And so all of these things, all these sort of feedback loops um, is exactly the potential that we have when we integrate a simulation context that's highly engaging um, with a visualization tool uh, like, um, like Tableau. But there's a lot of cognitive load on the students to do all of that. And so they need a lot of support to do that. Uh, you've got to coach them, you've got to give them breaks. Um, you've got to tickle their thinking if you if you really want it to be successful um, because otherwise it's too hard and too time consuming and they don't see the benefit and then they really don't really understand and they miss the potential um, of the tool. So I'm mindful that we're already at um, eight minutes over time. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, this is Abdi, back to me again. Um, it's, it's really good. I, I, I don't know if any of you, I, I, I assume some of you have, uh, have used uh, monsoon sim data to study data analytics. I don't know if any of you have, uh, uh, have anything to add or have anything to share or have any questions. Yes, Mr. Abdi. Uh, hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, sure, again. Uh, so may I ask, yes. uh, for the coming competition, uh, will, will, we, will the teams be allowed to access the database? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, we will make it available. So uh, feel free to, uh, yes, yes. It's, uh, it it's in November. Will... Right, right, right. But for national, will the means like uh, the database, like just now the live data access, of course, each team will be given their own database to be assessor. Am I? Uh, is it? Is it going to be? When you do your, when you have your preliminary, preliminary rounds, you guys can go ahead and practice that. But when we have a competition, then we'll open up the, uh, the, the, the data, the credentials, so they can, you know, they can use it. But I, I you know, the, given the time is short, and as Derek says, they really need time to reflect. Uh, I don't know if we have. Uh, if, if they can really help the, them make any decision, but it, nonetheless, it's a very good, uh, it's a good exposure, it's good experience for the student to, to, to tap into the data. I mean, last competition in Hong Kong, um, a number of uh, Hong Kong Poly U students actually use uh, Tableau to, to look into the data. But last year they were using uh, live, uh, you know, the export da exported data, but this year you can use live access, so yes. So that means live access will be allowed? Yes. Okay, that's all I need to ask. Thank you. Um, just a nuance I didn't mention before, but what I was showing in the dashboard, you know, as an example of the kind of thing I would use to debrief the game outcome with the students, um, that's using the instructor login, which has access to all the data from all the teams so that you can actually compare, right? Um, there's separate logins for the teams where they would only see their own data. Uh, okay, back to Q&A. Any question? I have a question Christine, for yeah. Christine. Go ahead, Alfred. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, Christine, um, now uh, you, were, you were talking about how, how, how classes were delivered and all, and I, I'm particularly uh, interested in your insight into how, uh, 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 because at, at modules are delivered separately and individually, uh, focusing on uh, different topics. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, uh, could you provide some insight into how uh, uh, games are being played uh, and, and at different time, uh, we focus on, on, on a different area. Like for example, early on, you mentioned accounting management, accounting and all. Uh, let's say in this yeah. case, um, we are focusing on uh, analytics. Uh, right, so we, we actually don't go down the depth of analytics that um, Derek showed you. 
So we, we stop before that so that we, our assessments are more around um, accounting um, and strategy rather than a lot of data analytics. However, what we do each week is cumulatively build on the game. So the modules that we start in one week, um, we would have open for the next week and then we would build new, add more modules in. So that by the time we get to our fourth week, we're probably running you know, 90% of the modules. We're, how fast we move on though? Well, so we would start, we would open a module. Really the academic in the room makes a call when he or she feels the students have um, learned what we're hoping they will learn from that module. So some things come um, really, um, you know, some modules students pick up very fast. For example, forecasting, it's quite a simple module and students pick up on it very quickly. And so we might only spend uh, 10, 15 minutes having them play with that before we open up something else. When we start looking at manufacturing and you're buying machines and you've got maintenance, that takes longer for students um, to adapt and to work out um, how to operate and control that. So we're really quite responsive to what's happening in the room. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that means we, we you could stack you could stack your module up, and oh. as you progress along, right? Yes, and so in our fourth week, we normally have nearly every module open, and we just let them uh, play to try and find out who the winner is. You know, so we actually come up with an overall winner. Um, because we think at, at that point, they really should be pulling everything together. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, uh, I would like to ask one question. Hello? Sure. Yeah, who would you like to speak to? Me, yes. Derek? Abdi, me. Okay. Both of you. I mean, uh, your uh, lectures are so uh, related to each other. Uh, first, we got how to the activities and assessments, and then how to use that analysis to measure that uh, activities and to measure the students' improvement. Oh, uh, we do it based on our metrics, so that we. Um, so, if you have a student group, for example, a team that goes bankrupt in week one, we would expect them to explain to us what went wrong and what they're going to do in the future. So if we have teams who go bankrupt two weeks in a row, then we say, you're not actually learning from what you're meant to be learning. You know, you're being cowboys and just clicking and, and playing without strategizing. So we really do look at their performance and ask them to justify within the class. Um, so informally to justify what they're doing and why they're doing it. So that you can have a student, you know, we can have a student's team that maybe does a, a B2B and doesn't uh, do the pricing well, and so their performance can fall in that area over, you know, between weeks. But we would expect that retail sales would keep improving because they should learn um, how to manage their inventory levels, <clears throat> how to ensure automatic transfers between the warehouse and, and the different stores. And so we would we look at those things, but it's quite informally in the classroom for those things. That's around sort of their level of professionalism. Um, and to encourage them to actually think rather than just click and play. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So it's it's fun as a lecturer because you're on your toes all the time as well. Okay, good. Just one question. To the people, yeah, to the people in Australia. Uh, may I know how long have you been running uh, Monsoon Sim in the university, and then have uh, all have the students who played this uh, graduated, and then yeah. uh, and then uh, how? Uh, how they make use or, or how they benefited from uh, Monsoon Sim while applying for a job or while working? Um, it's difficult to, to tie that down. So we've been using it for four years. We started in 2017. We run it three trimesters a year. So we've had a number of opportunities to run this. Um, it's difficult to pull out just the simulation because we think our whole capstone experience is geared to assisting students when they go particularly for graduate in, graduate interviews, when they've actually got to sit in a group. I mean, um, they often go and there's a group task assigned and they've got to work as, uh, as a team to come up with a solution. And the solution is obviously not always around an accounting issue. It's often around environmental or some issues where there's issue where the students won't have a, a standard answer. So it's difficult to pull out what the simulation does alone, but it does, you know, for what, 
we understand from what we've spoken to students and also from recruiters that our students um, seem to be able to work very well when they come to those group tasks. So I think part of it is from the game, from sharing and using um, the different skills within the team. But I think it also comes from our case study approach where we are, we really um, encourage students through the nature of the task to drill down. What is the issue? You know, what are the alternatives? What alternative would you recommend? You know, um, what are the strengths in this case? What are the weaknesses? What led to this behaviour? So I think it's the combination um, that helps our students, but we often get very positive feedback from employers saying that our students seem very well prepared for their interview processes. All right, cool. Thank you very much for that response. Okay, uh, any other um, questions? Um, if not, let me go back to my uh, slide and I'm go just going to uh, close it. There's some contact here uh, for you guys. Uh, are you looking at okay so here are the here are the contact if you have some question that you like to uh, ask um, we have uh, in Australia New Zealand you can co uh, contact me directly at the at monsoon sim uh, in Singapore Malaysia you can contact Alex at monsoon .com, and in Philippines uh, please contact Donald all right and they are here um, if they're Donald at monsoon .com. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Um, Christine, thank you so much for your time. It's, uh, and Derek, uh, thank you for the insights. Uh, amazing stuff. You're, You're welcome. Truly, uh, thank you for having, truly, thank you for having uh, me. A data analytic expert. Um, you know, really, really, you, you really walk the talk and so on. So it's really good. Okay, for the rest of you, we thank you so much from Monsoon Sim, really. Uh, and, and we hope to see you in the trainer trainer session 27 28 all right so thank you all one more time Thanks, bye all bye bye now